concerned with the meaning of provisions of the lease machinery for the calculation and payment of a service charge. Specifically, ground one and two, what consequences, if any, ought there to be attached to a failure to comply with a time stipulation? And ground four is concerned with whether legal costs are recoverable, um, are, are, are to be taken into account in the calculation of the tenants, the tenants, that's collectively the tenant's service charge. Ground three is concerned with the scope of the tenant's covenant to pay costs incurred by the landlord. As the court will appreciate, each of those grounds is concerned with the exercise of contraction interpretation. The court will be familiar with that exercise. The exercise is well known. If I may take the liberty just to draw out a few of the principles that might be relevant to the, um, the particular grounds and the issues that arise in this case. So first of all, the compliance with the stipulation as to time. As the court will have seen from our skeleton argument, we refer to the case of Bunge Corporation Trade Ex Export SA. Now that case concerned whether a time stipulation in a mercantile contract required st strict compliance, and it held that it was. But the principle relevant to our exercise was enunciated by Lord Wilberforce at page 716. Same place, turn that up. Please, please may, may you. It's at tab 8. Tab 8, page 716, the speech of Lord Wilberforce, and specifically at paragraph E. And there there's an approval of the statement of the law as it's expressed in Holdsbury Law, including the footnote um, approving the House of Lords' early decision in the United Scientific Holdings. And Lord Wilberforce says, appears, the statement there appears to be correct, in particular in asserting, one, that the court will require precise compliance with stipulations as to time wherever the circumstances of the case indicate that this would fulfil the intention of the parties. And two, broadly speaking, time will be considered of the essence in mercantile contracts. Second element there is not of application to this clause, it's the first one. That sets out the principle of approach. There, Lord Wilberforce referred to the United Scientific case. It's um, perhaps important to look briefly at that case because it was mentioned by um, Judge Cook in her judgment of the tribunal. Copies of tab seven. The issue in that case, there were two people appeals that went before the House of Lords, was whether or not a time stipulation in a rent review clause required strict compliance, and it held that it was not. Just pausing, although um, the case is mentioned in the Upper Tribunal's decision, I'm informed by Mr. Blakeney that the case itself was not actually mentioned in argument. As you would have appreciated from the papers, I, I, I hope, the issue was one raised by the judge, it was one not articulated by the party. The principles can be taken from, uh, I suggest, from three speeches. The first is that of Lord Diplock, and I ask you to turn to page 930, and specifically to paragraph G. So upon the question of principle, which these two appeals were brought to settle, I would hold that in the absence of contraindications in the express words of the lease, or in the interrelation the rent review clause itself and other clauses, or in the surrounding circumstances, the presumption is that the timetable specified in the rent review clause for completion of the various steps for determining the rent payable in respect to the period following the review date is not of the essence of the contract. Lord Simon, in his speech, expressed himself in similar terms at page 944, <coughs> specifically at paragraph B. In my view, the modern law in the case of contracts of all types is correctly summarised in Hosbury laws. Time will not be considered to be of the essence unless, one, the parties expressly stipulate that conditions as to time must be strictly complied with, or two, the nature of the subject matter of the contract or the surrounding circumstances show that time should be considered to be of the essence. And finally, if I can refer you to the speech of Lord Fraser, page 958. Paragraph B through to D. There in his speech, Lord Fraser refers to the extract in Holdsbury's, which we've already seen from the speech of Lord Simon. The paragraph beginning just below paragraph C. Clearly, neither the first nor the third of these exceptions is explicable um, is applicable, big pun, to either of the instant appeals. 
The question is whether the nature of the subject matter or the surrounding circumstances of rent review clauses as a class show that all or any stipulations as to time in such clauses normally fall within the second exception. The pausing there shows that the focus is on the clause, not the contract in its entirety. In other words, they can strict compliance, strict compliance can be required for certain clauses when it's not required for others. As regards contraindications, in our skeleton we refer to an extract in Woodfall's Landlord and Tenant. And that can be found in uh, tab 34. <coughs> the extract at tab 34 is to be found in paragraph 818, say of Woodfall's Landlord and Tenant. And the two sentences I would like to do just to look at for a moment are to be found on the fourth line the existence of a dealing provision. The existence of a dealing provision expressly setting out the consequence of failing to comply with a particular procedural step is a decisive or virtually decisive contraindication. If the court fails to give effect to such a provision, it is altering the substance of the party's contractual rights. What's meant by a deeming provision? If there is, perhaps, my lord. Sorry to ask such a basic question. <laughs> if there is a consequence which is deemed to occur in the event that a time stipulation isn't complied with, if to, to, to get ahead of ourselves, what we will be saying here is that there is a deeming provision because there is a, um, there is a fixed sum to be paid unless something else happens. Consequently, the landlord is deemed to say to accept that the interim charge is £360 a year unless it operates the notice machinery in the subparagraph 10. But you're paraphrasing, in, in that formulation, you're paraphrasing what the contract actually says. Yes, I, 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 I'm coming okay. to look at more closely what, what it does say, but the reason for drawing attention to that particular passage and in answer to your Lordship's question and to, is to foreshadow what, what an argument, what one of our arguments will be. Well, it's almost an implied deeming provision on your analysis because what, what's being spoken of here is the, the classic example of a rent review clause which says um, if you don't serve a counter notice by a certain date, you are deemed to be um, bound by the landlord's figure. Well, it, it, it's a matter of construction. It's not necessarily yes. implying a deeming provision. I accept that the words, the, um, the verb to deem is not to be found in the language of our clause. I, I, of course, I fully accept that. Um, it's what is the what, what what is the intention of the clause? What did the parties intend its effect to be in the event that the the procedure wasn't operated? Well, I see the force of the argument that the the way in which the clause is intended to operate is that unless certain steps are taken by a prescribed time, certain consequences will flow from that. Correct, and I I, I would seek to develop the analysis one step further in that it can be deemed that the landlord is content to accept £360 unless it operates the machinery. Yes. The, the next area, if I may, in terms of um, the approach to contractual interpretation is the interpretation of service charge provisions. And, and just briefly, I think you said there were two sentences. They were those two sentences, were Yes, they, they were. Well. Yes, I follow. Yep. Thank you. Um, the, the next area, um, if I may, just to struggle the court with, um, uh, as to the, the correct approach to contractual interpretation, is the interpretation of service charge provisions, which is materially relevant to, to this appeal. And um, as you will have seen from um, the paperwork, um, the considerable reference is given to a case of Seller House and Mears repeatedly referred to in the, in the case law is referred to in the, in the decision for the subject of the appeal and of material relevance of the speech as the judgment of Lord Taylor in that case. Uh, a copy of the decision is at tab 10. And the issue in that case was where the cost that the landlord had incurred in proceedings against other tenants were recoverable from this tenant under the service charge machinery. And the clauses that were um, 
under consideration are to be found at the bottom of page 154 and the top of 155. So the first, co so first covenant on which, under which it was said that um, by the landlord it was permissible for the cost to recover the cost through the service charge is that recited at the bottom of page 154. And then the second is over the page of page 155. The conclusion of um, Lord Justice Dillon is to be found at the top of page 156. Expresses himself as having a certain hesitation on this point in the light of the argument in relation to the position where solicitors are instructed by the managing agent as to whether those might be said to be costs of the managing agent. That doesn't arise here. There's no suggestion that the lawyers were instructed by the managing agent. It does not appear from the evidence whether that was actually the case. On the whole, however, I've come to the conclusion that the judge was right in his view that the fees of solicitors and counsel are outside the contemplation of either of the two clauses um, that we've seen. And then we move to the judgment of Lord Justice Taylor. I add only a few words on the issue whether legal fees can be included in the service charge under the lease. Nowhere in clause 54J is there any specific mention of lawyers, proceedings, or legal costs. The scope of J1 is concerned with management. J2, it is with maintenance, safety, and administration. On the respondent's argument, a tenant paying his rent and service charge regularly would be liable via the service charge to subsidise the landlord's legal costs of suing his co-tenants if they were all defendants. For my part, I should require to see a clause in clear and unambiguous terms before being persuaded that that result was intended by the parties. Accordingly, I agree with my lord that the terms of these paragraphs do not extend to cover legal costs in the service charge. And it's the need for clarity and an absence of, of ambiguity that is the uh, refrain that appears in subsequent, subsequent cases. And significantly, that the judgment of Lord Justice Taylor has received very recent endorsement by this court. In the case of number one West India Quay and East Tower Apartments, which is in tab 33. An issue in that appeal was whether the landlord's costs incurred in tribunal proceedings, litigating service charge expenditure, and in particular the recoverability of utility charges, was recoverable through the tenant service charge. The judgment was given by Lord Justice Henderson, and his treatment, of, his treatment of this issue begins at paragraph 68. tribunal, the matter was considered by the Deputy President. What he said in his judgment, quoted, in my judgment, although the charges are switched to for calculating utility charges would fall within this formulation, the cost of litigating about those charges does not. The language is direct, directed towards the provision of management service, not litigation. Then at 71, Lord Justice uh, Henderson refers to the Seller House and Mears case. And recites at the top of, uh, over the page the judgment from Lord Justice Taylor that we've just seen. It describes that case as being apposite in the circumstances. 
after reciting the, the judgment of Lord Justice Taylor, Lord Justice Henson, I consider that mutatis mutandis, the same points may be made about the provisions with which we are now concerned. I cannot see any error in the approach of the upper tribunal to this issue or to the conclusion which it reached. We said that's a very recent endorsement, but what was said by Lord Justice Taylor still rings true. The, the need for clarity is also echoed in, uh, by the then Chancellor and Phillips and Francis. That's to be found in tab 22. And in that case, the issue was the recoverability of management charges. And again, that issue there uh, engaged the question of whether the provisions that made up the calculation of the service charge captured those, that captured those charges. A, a different context to the present one, not concerning legal fees. But the then Chancellor said the following in relation to um, service charge provisions. And this is to be found at paragraph 74, which is on internal page 766 of the report. Paragraph 74, the reported cases are generally consistent with the broad principle that it's reasonable to expect that if the parties to a lease intend that the lessor should be entitled to receive payment from the tenant in addition to the rent, that obligation and its extent will be clearly spelt out in the lease. See, for example, uh, the judgment law or Justice Murray and Gilgey and Childrove. It is to be expected that the tenant will wish to be fully aware of any such additional obligation on what his or her continued right to possess the land and to occupy it may depend. It is to be expected that the lessor will wish to make such a continuing additional obligation clear because it arises under a lease which will subsist through successive ownerships of the reversion and the tenancy and because the lessor will not wish to be out of pocket in respect of services provided for for the benefit of the tenant. And against that background, we have the judgment of Lord, just, of Lord Newberger in Arnold and Britain. That's at tab 24. The passage of um, Lord Newberg's judgment in that case, um, relevant to the interpretation of service charges, is found in paragraph 23, which is at terminal page 1629. This is the final seven factors um, which um, his lordship wished to draw out um, in relation to the exercise of contractual interpretation. The reason to go to the seventh is, is the one that deals with the interpretation of service charge clauses. Seventhly, references made in argument to service charge clauses being construed restrictively. I am unconvinced by the notion that service charge clauses are to be subject to any special rule of interpretation. Even if, which is not, it is unnecessary to decide, a landlord may have simpler remedies than a tenant to enforce service charge provisions, that is not relevant to the issue of how one interprets the contractual machinery for assessing the tenant's contribution. The origin of the adverb was in a judgment of Lord Justice Ricks in McHale and Earl Cadogan. What he was saying quite correctly was the court should not bring within the general words of a service charge clause anything which does not clearly belong there. However, that does not help resolve the issue of interpretation raised in this case. But again, one sees echoing the need for clarity. Um, before leaving um, that, uh, the Lord Newburgh's decision in um, Arnold Britain, there are a number of other passages which are relevant to the exercise. Um, the first is to uh, paragraph 15. And there, um, His Lordship summarises the, 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 the key factors um, to be borne in mind when interpreting a contractual provision. You'll see at the bottom that they're um, in a series of Roman numeral um, items. And it's the, the third of which that what is relevant, what one has to have in mind, is the overall purpose of the clause. And over the page, um, dealing with these seven factors which he seeks to emphasise in relation to the exercise, item three, which is the paragraph 19. The third point I should mention is that commercial common sense is not to be invoked retrospectively 
the mere fact that a contractual arrangement, if interpreted according to its natural language, has worked out badly or even disastrously for one of the parties is not a reason for departing from the natural language. And the third um, element to draw out, if I may, is at um, um, paragraph 22. Sixthly, in some cases, an event subsequently occurs which was plainly not intended or contemplated by the parties, judging from their language of the contract. In such a case, if it is clear what the parties would have intended, the court will give effect to that intention. An example of such a case is Aberdeen City Council and Stuart Milne Group, where the court concluded that any approach other than that which was adopted would defeat the party's clear objective, but the conclusion was based on what the parties had in mind when they entered into the contract. Returning, if I may, to the, um, just to the approach to the interpretation of um, service charges, forgive me for being distracted just whilst we had the final Britain open. Um, at tab 27, there's a decision of um, the late um, Judge Bridge in the Upper Tribunal, in the case of Sinclair Gardens and Haven Estates. That was a case concerning the recoverability of legal uh, fees incurred in tribunal proceedings through the service charge. The, um, the relevant clause is at paragraph 8. So, can you just say again which tab you're on? I, I apologize, my lord. Uh, paragraph 27, uh, tab 27. Thank you. It was another case um, concerning the recoverability of legal costs through a service charge. At paragraph 8, you see the relevant clause which is at subparagraph 2, it's the employment of architects, surveyors, solicitors, accountants, contractors, builders, gardeners, and any other person, firm, or company in or in relation to this, uh, uh, probably required to be employed in connection with or for the purposes of or in relation to the estate and the block or any part thereof. Um, in, in connection with the interpretation of that clause at paragraph 22, His Honour Judge Bridge pulls together those three cases of Seller, Alstomeers, Phillips and Francis, and what was said by Lord Newberger in Arnold and Britain. not making assumptions as to what words mean, even if they're of common phraseology, to, to, to reflect upon the actual words used. 
release that is dated the 15th of October 1982. The tenant's covenant is to be found in two clauses. First, clause 3, which is page 7 of the bundle. So clause 3, there the tenant covenants with its landlord to observe and perform the obligation set out in the fourth of the schedules for the lease. Then there's clause 4, which concerns a service charge machinery. Before looking at that, we see that the covenant there is given with both the landlord and for the benefit of the owners and lessees for the time being. So that's a distinction between the beneficiaries of the two covenants. Clause 3 is with the landlord, clause 4 is not only with the landlords but the other tenants. And in connection with that, move forward to page 27. Just, just can you slow down just a fraction for a moment? Of course, my lord. connection with that, um, with those lessee covenants, we'll see a page 27, which is to be found um, in the six, which six, six schedule begins at page 26, and those set out the landlord's covenants. You'll see it subparagraph 2 on page 27. So the landlord covenants to extract like covenants from each of the lessees. That as regards four, it sets up a scheme of mutual enforceability. Going then back to page seven, we look and we make look at clause four, which is the service charge machine. Clause four, subparagraph two. Subparagraph two one identifies that the expenditure, so that's the service charge cost, the cost that will be taken into account in determining or calculating a tenant service charge, are the cost the landlord spends in connection with the matter sent out in the seventh schedule. It's not in connection with, it's on the matters. On the matters, sorry. Subparagraph 2 deals with the payment of a maintenance contribution on account. So to pay the maintenance contribution specified in paragraph 9 of the particulars, the particulars are on the front page of the lease. So page 3 of the bundle, and that specifies a contribution to be £360 per year. Or, such revised sum as shall be calculated in accordance with the provisions of paragraph uh, F, paragraph 10 of this subclause, as a contribution towards the maintenance charge. Such sum to be paid on the by, to be paid to the lessor by equal half yearly payments in advance on the first day of April and the first day of October in each year, the first payment being proportionate part thereof, calculated from the date hereof to the first of April. Subclause 10 is at page 10 of the list of the, of the bundle. It is further specifically provided that the lessor may, if it thinks fit, revise and adjust the maintenance contribution for any of the lessor's financial years to such amount as it shall deem necessary in the light of expenditure reasonably anticipated for that year. Notice of such revision and adjustment to be served on the lessee not less than one month prior to the commencement of the financial that financial year, and that maintenance contribution so revised and adjusted shall be payable by the lessee in accordance with paragraph two. So the revised sum equally falls to be paid by two equal half yearly installments on the first of April and first of October. The going back to the service charge machinery, at clause four two three. Subclause sub 3, page 8. So, forgive me, this is paraphrasing, but that clause contains the year end reconciliation. That's the year end balancing exercise. You look at what has been spent. It's not quite that, is it? It's the, it's the actual calculation of expenditure, is the first and important thing. Because yes. the CMC 
is an is an estimate. Yes. And it's for cash flow purposes to give rise to interim payments on the first of April and the first of October. Yes. It doesn't fix the maintenance charge in any other in, in any way at all. The maintenance charge, as as I've understood it, which may be not at all, is fixed in accordance with sub clause three. Yes, the defined term of maintenance contribution is the payment on account. Correct. And what we are now talking about is something quite different, which is the actual maintenance charge, which is calculated by reference to Schedule 7. Correct, but the payment of the maintenance contribution is, is set off against it. Is, but it's expressly as a contribution towards the maintenance yes. charge mm, under subparagraph 2. Yeah, but it doesn't actually influence what, have, what the maintenance charge will be at all. Well, except in terms of cash flow, which is that if they've overrated the CMC, then there may be some money to come back. So, um, forgive me for my choice, choice of expression, if I try and unpack when I said a, a reconciliation exercise, it, ident it does, has two functions. This clause carries two functions. One is to identify what the um, expenditure was for the, for the, for the year, yes. to identify the service charge. But secondly, it, it does the reconciliation to see what additional sum, if any, is due from the tenant. And that's to be found in the middle of the paragraph. One, two, three, four lines down, where it makes provision for due credit being given for the advance contribution, yeah. which necessarily must mean the maintenance, I accept it's not referred to in terms, but that must mean the maintenance contribution. Yeah. And then you have the payment within 28 days of any balance. But, but forgive me for being very basic. I, I understood it to be part of your submission that there is a real difference and distinction to be drawn between the maintenance charge, which is calculated and certified and all that stuff, at the end of the year when the actual expenditure is known. And that is the tenant's ultimate liability. And the CMC, which on your case is estimated in advance if you want to depart from 360, and is paid in two equal tranches, 1st of April, 1st of October, and will be set off one way or the other when you come to the question of is there anything left of the out of the maintenance charge to be paid? Have I, have I understood the position? That, that's correct. And the significance of the clause is that um, although we say, we say time is appreciate um, that there, there is a requirement to comply with the, the time stipulation in relation to the notice to revise the make quarter of the maintenance contribution, we don't say that time is of the essence for the purposes of that clause, sub clause three, the final reconciliation exercise. The significance of that is, is that if strict compliance is required in relation to the paragraph 10 notice, it, and it, the, the, the requirements are not met, it doesn't have the consequence of depriving the landlord no. of a service charge. And that's a big distinction with rent review cases, because a justification for not holding time to be of the essence in rent review clauses is that if the time is missed, the landlord is then prevented from reviewing the rent for maybe a number of years. And that goes contrary to the arrangement, because the consideration in a, in a lease, the tenant comes and says, I want a long lease of commercial premises. And the landlord's saying, well, there's going to be a change in the value of money. There's going to be a change in the value of property. I need to re-gear the rent. And so that's the con corresponding consideration. The tenant gets the longer lease in consideration of there being a re-gauging of the rent. And if that rent isn't re-gauged, one way of looking at it is it goes against the consideration for the long lease in the first instance. And it deprives the landlord of that reviewed rent until the next day. What we're saying is that our interpretation doesn't deprive the landlord of, of, of essentially of obtaining a service charge, being recovering as is, to the extent is permissible, its expenditure from the tenants. It can do that, and it can do it at the year end by carrying out, again, to give the expression, this reconciliation exercise, or this calculating what is the maintenance contribution, the, ca calculating what is referred to as the maintenance charge and then seeing whether there is a deficit or a surplus, and then the machinery of how one deals with that, whether there's a payment to be made or whether there's a balance to be carried forward to credit. Well, it's actuals versus estimates. As my Lord says, it's a, it's a, it's a payment on account for cash flow purposes. So what happens is that the um, managing agents or whoever they may be on behalf of the landlord will um, estimate what the likely expenditure is going to be in the, in the course of the financial year serve a notice and you have to pay it half yearly at the end of the year they look back 
see what's actually been expended, whether there's anything carried forward from the previous period. Yes. Uh, and they set the one off against the other, and they either set it off against the future or they put it into a, a sinking fund or whatever else they do. But that's, that's the way it operates in practice. A absolutely. We're saying it doesn't deprive the landlord of responsibility no. for receiving a service charge. Well, it can't possibly deprive him of that because no. he's got the right to, to the service charge accounts under three. Yes, but, 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 but forgive me if I'm, if I'm repeating myself, but what I wanted to do was to make the point that our interpretation of um, par subparagraph 10 doesn't deprive the landlord no. of receipt of a, a service charge. If you're content that in relation to three, there's no question of time being We're not essence. correct. The All that happens, if you are right, is that, it's, uh, that he's delayed in recovering what is due to him. Uh, uh, over and above £360. Yeah, over and above £360. Correct. The and we're just looking at paragraph three because there is a time stipu um, uh, there is a time stipulation within there, and that's where one has looked, done the reconciliation between the estimates and the actuals. Um, and if there's a, 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 a balance due, then that's to be paid within 28 days. So there is a there is a time stipulation there. The and there's an interest provision later yeah. on, isn't there? Yeah. And then there's an interest provision later on. Um, but the, the, uh, the point that the, is the choice of language. There's a payment within 28 days, whereas when one looks went back to the paragraph 10, it's not less than one month. It's more directive to what is required. Then, paragraph five, sub, sub paragraph five, sorry, pardon. Um, so the amount of the maintenance charge, so that's the, the service charge at the year end, is ascertained um, and certified by a certificate. And then, following service of that certificate under sub clause eight. Following, following production or furnishing of that certificate, the lessee by appointment with the lessor within 28 days may inspect the vouchers. So there's another time stipulation, but not expressed in the same way as we saw in subclause sub 10. And then under subclause 9, again, a time stipulation if within 28 days, um, the, a, a body of the lessee is mounted to not less than three quarters. So 75% of the lessees wish the certificate to be verified by an independent auditor. And they can require that. So the point for, to draw out of those additional clauses we looked at was that there is a time stipulation and is expressed in a different way. And then we have um, Schedule Seven, which identifies the matters, um, the matters on which the landlord may incur expenditure. Then uh, form the basis for calculating the maintenance charge. The so Schedule 7, the relevance um, there is to, to ground 4, is paragraph 5. So that's so Schedule 7 begins at page 30. For the introduction, costs, paragraph, page 30, costs, expenses, outgoings, and matters in respect to which the lessee is to contribute by way of a service charge. And then relevant to ground four, this appeal is paragraph five, which is framed as, that's on page 31, the cost of employing such professional advisors and agents as shall be reasonably required in connection with the management of the building. So that is the clause which we're concerned with in terms of ground four as to whether it's broad enough to capture legal fees in connection with tribunal proceedings. If I may, um, schedule four, so you'll recall that clause three of the lessee's covenant with the landlord to form the obligations in schedule four. Schedule four is to be found at page 17. It's relevant to ground three is paragraph five. That's on page 18. There, the tenant has covenanted with the land with the with the landlord to pay all costs, charges, and expenses, including solicitors' costs and surveyors' fees, 
incurred by the lessor for the purpose or of or incidental to the preparation and service of a notice under section 146 of the Law of Property Act 1925, notwithstanding forfeiture may be avoided otherwise than by relief granted by the court, and to pay or expenses incurred by the lessor incidental to the preparation and service of a schedule of dilapidations at the expiration or sooner determination of the term hereby granted. So the focus is on the words for the purposes of or incidental to the preparation and service of a notice under section 146. Yes, relevant to the interpretation is, is I would say, the final um, um, clause of the, the sentence, which also directs the pay for the preparation and service of a schedule of dilapidations. Because you'll appreciate from our argument, one of the, it's, it's as much as the words that are used as the words that are not used. It's the omission of the word proceeding. And so what we say is this clause is directed to the preparation of documents not concerned with proceedings. One, because proceedings isn't there. But two, the, the focus in the first part of the clause is on the notice, and that's echoed in the cost of preparing a schedule of a terminal dilapidations. It doesn't refer to the cost of any proceedings in connection with any terminal dilapidations liability. But you can't, surely you can't sort of reverse engineer mm -hmm. from the fact that you don't, for example, have to go to a court in order to set up a schedule of dilapidations say that therefore you, the cost of going to court in order to set up a section 146 notice, I'm using set up in the broadest possible sense, thereby avoiding the issue. That you can't reverse it like that and say because it doesn't apply to dilapidations, it doesn't apply to section 146 notice. Can you? Well, I, I would say it's because each is a step, because simply serving 146 notice doesn't entitle the landlord to forfeit. There's still another step, which is a proceeding. At the time of the lease, if there was a dispute about the um, whether there had been a breach, that would need to be conducted within proceedings. So it was a necessary part of the elements of forfeiture that there would be proceedings. And the same with terminal dilapidations. A service schedule, if there is a dispute about it, they will necessarily be proceeding. But the difference is a schedule of dilapidations has effect without it being inevitably necessary go to court. A section 146 notice, as I understand the position, is effectively ineffective unless you go to court and get the ruling. I, I would disagree with that, no, because the, okay. the function of a 146 is a, is, a, is a warning shot across the bows. Because if one looks at, if one looks at section 146.1, a landlord who remedies the breach specified in the hundred, in section 146 notice and pays reasonable compensation avoids forfeiture. When you say, I think he's a landlord, you mean the tenant? Or it's a tenant, a big part of it, yes. yes. Yeah. Just sort of looking at the language, it, it, it appears on its face, at least, to envisage that the charges and expenses that are to be recoverable are in, in anticipation of um, the production of in the one case, the notice, and in the other, the, the schedule of dilapidations. In, it, in other words, it's steps leading up to um, a necessary for or incidental to um, the preparation and service of a notice, rather than what happens after you've served the notice. Well, um, yes, but when we, um, you may recall uh, in the upper tribunal's decision, they, they, um, her Honor, uh, Judge Cook set out a table of different cases and to, mm. just to show the clauses. And you'll see there's a repeated refrain of, different, of um, difference with our clause. Is that there, it goes further. It's not just the cost of incidental to preparing the notice, but it's also or in contemplation of proceedings. And so there is, there is a distinction between the drafting of our clause and those clauses in that there has been, I would say, a conscious omission. Quite. That's the point I was making, is that what, what you don't have is any reference to proceedings at all. So you're looking at the language that is there and looking at the language as it stands without reference to incidental proceedings or anything else. It seems to me, uh, on, on, a, on a first glance, that the charges and expenses and costs that are incurred are in relation to the preparation and service of the notice on the one hand or the preparation and service of the schedule of dilapidations on the other, which means that the end product 
is the document. Yes. And so it can't, as a matter of normal language, refer to anything that happens after that document has been prepared and served. Yes, albeit that the respondent's argument is that it is broad enough to now capture proceedings because there has been a change in the legislation which has moved the proceedings to a stage in the process that precedes the notice. Well, that's the, that's the $64,000 question because if you cannot get a notice without going through certain, jumping through certain hoops and going to court, uh, then why aren't the costs, charges and expenses um, for the purpose of um, the preparation and service of the notice because you can't prepare and serve a notice without jumping through those hurdles. Well, you, you, correct, but it doesn't necessarily follow that the breadth of the word for the purposes of encapsulates proceedings, because at the time there was always going to need to be proceedings. The structure of forfeiture always required proceedings if there is a dispute as to whether there's a bridge. Because the landlord cannot make out its right of re-entry unless it can establish a bridge. So the, there were always going to be, even at the time of the lease in 1982, if the, if the tenant disputed breach, it necessitated proceedings. And the parties, by their language, we would say, have not agreed that the tenant should indemnify for that exercise. Now, what's happened, is, and at that time, the, the proceedings are conducted in court, and the court has jurisdiction over the cost. So what the parties have said, we say, is, well, the question of the cost of arguing over breach, arguing over other matters, is to be left to the forum to yes. resolve that dispute that Parliament's designated. So why does it change that intention if Parliament has intervened and said, I'm going to move those proceedings, which are always there, but I'm just going to make it earlier in the process? What's more, instead of, the part at the time, the process being that the, land, the, the parties are leaving the question of cost to the resolution of the court, it may reflect the landlord gets a cost, it may that the landlord doesn't get all of its cost because it's over-exaggerated its claim, or it may even be that the tenant gets its cost. Whereas now, the tenant can't get its cost because it's a largely cost-free jurisdiction. And so what's happened is, that in, as well as moving the process, we're changing the intention because instead of it, well, we'll leave, there's a, there's a, there's a balance. Yeah. Each side bears risk that they may be responsible for costs. If we now incorporate this, read this clause as encapsulating the process post the fire of 2002, there's a, there is no longer a position of equivalence. It's all one way. It is only the landlord who can recover its costs. Is the position in the tribunal that you don't get your costs? It's a drop hands. It, it's it's a it's a large it's a largely cost free jurisdiction because there are subject to unreasonable benefits. Unreasonableness and wasted essential yeah. wasted cost regime. So your position is that if you look at it objectively from the perspective of the reasonable on, um, onlooker or bystander at the time that this contract was entered into, which you must, um, it's clear that at that stage it was contemplated that litigation, which would be in practical terms inevitable but would come after the service of the notice, would be left to the tribunal, in which case the winner would get the cost and the loser would, would not. And that's even-handed, and that's what they decide to bargain for. Because Parliament has changed the mechanism by moving all of that forward, uh, such that the landlord now um, has to jump through certain hurdles before he gets the 146 notice, doesn't change that intention. That's the point. Right, because it's the, the landlord still you still litigate the breach, whereas in the past the tenant had the opportunity to say, I want my, I'm entitled to my costs, and the parties left it to that forum to decide how the Instance of caution line. That no, that does not exist under the current structure. Now you're, you're covering a lot of ground, which will that to save you time later on. But, but I am concerned that you should be able to develop your submissions systematically. Yes. Um, have we looked at what we need to in the lease? Um, well, there were um, uh, there were a number of other provisions which I can come to in the argument. It's part yeah. of the iterative process to see where else in the lease you see the word proceedings, where else you see in the lease expressions of solicitors' costs, and where else you see in the lease machinery for enforcement. Yeah. Um, but we can look at those. You, to them. In which case, you come on now, do you, to your grounds one and two, really? Uh, or, or, or are there other things you need to tell us about before we get to grounds one and two? No. What, what I was going to um, briefly deal with in terms of the legislative framework, I think I've, we've just done in. in in light of the exchange with the ladyship. Is it worth just showing us the provisions? Yes. 
So perhaps what needs to be looked at is section 140, 146 first. So that's in tab one. On the second page. So that's restrictions on relief from forfeiture of leases, of leases and under leases. Section 146, um, and there was a precursor to this in the late 19th century, but it, what, what, what section, the effect of 146 is to install a, a, a procedure that the landlord must go through before it exercises its contractual right of re-entry. That is the requirement to serve a notice. And um, in answer to his Lordship's question about, well, the 146 notice inevitably leads to proceedings, it's subsection one that identifies that you only move forward with forfeiture if the tenant fails to within a reasonable time to remedy the breach and pay compensation. Yeah. The, the, two, the provision that we are concerned with in terms of Parliament's intervention is section 81 of the Housing Act 1996, which is tab three. First intervention, so it's, it's an intervention of two stages. The first came in with the Act in '96, which is Section 81, Subsection 1. The landlord may not, in relation to premises, letters of dwelling, exercise of right of reentry of forfeiture, failure to buy a tenant to pay a service charge or administration charge, unless it's finally determined by the appropriate tribunal, by the court, or by an arbitral tribunal in proceedings pursuant to a post dispute arbitration agreement, that the amount of the service charge or administration charge is payable by him or the tenant is admitted. So you have to have a determination of breach. And then um, the significant change from in two th by the 2002 Act Common Hold Leasehold Reform Act is subsection 4A, which is over the page. The effect of section 4, so 4A, references in this section to the exercise of a right of re-entry or forfeiture include service of a notice under section 1461. Well, they identify what, what's yes. happened is that you now need to have that determination or admission. Before the section 146 notice. Before the section 146 notice. Um, we've included, but not relevant for the purpose of this appeal, there are similar provisions in relation to other forms of breach of tenancies. So this is concerned with service charges, administration charges, administration charges being contractual agreements to pay a sum other than rental service charge. So there's life provision. So, if, for example, if you fail to repair or if you cause a nuisance, and those um, for completeness are um, dealt with under section 168 of Tab 4, section 168 of the Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act 2002. What, what's the What's the difference in effect between Section 81, 4A, and Section 168? So 168 deals with breaches other than non-payment of service charge. So the regime for failure to comply with a covenant to pay a service charge or administration charge is dealt with under Section 81 of the Housing Act 96. Other breaches, <coughs> use of the property, alterations, alienation, be dealt with under section process under 168. The and we we haven't got have we the uh, costs rules, but I can provide those um, subsequently. They aren't in there. No. It's about the limited jurisdiction of yes, we can provide those. But, but as her ladyship said, it's, it's, it's a limited regime. Yes. Principally unreasonable conduct. Yes. Um, naturally keen to move straight to, to grab this. Just, if I may, can just quickly look um, to have it in mind the, the demand for the interim charge, which is in the supplemental bundle at tab five. 
page 54. So this, this, this is a demand raised on the 15th of August 2019. And this was for the first time for these relevant years, was there a demand made to increase the maintenance contribution beyond 360? Was this the first time ever? I, I phrase it in that way because I don't know going all the way back to 1982. I, I couldn't, I couldn't answer and that is way. it your case that uh, if you want to be above 360, you have to serve expressly each year? Correct. Or if you, and is that because it's an estimate of what you have what you anticipate your expenditure yeah, to be over yeah. the next 12 months. Or a particular year, correct. Yeah. And I, 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 my understanding is that wasn't the respondent's position in the upper tribunal. That was rejected by the upper tribunal, and there's no cross appeal against that finding. Yeah. So, so, I, I, so we deal with it on the basis that, that such a notice is year specific. Correct. Thank you. So for the year 2018, 2019, First of April 18 to the 31st of March 19, the notice for that year was given on the 15th of August 2019. Yes. And the first four items, the, the year is wholly past, and the next two items, the, the period is current, but notice is not served before. Correct. And just because the two items, they are, yet they're items in respect of um, a single period. So this is not a demand for the 1st of October. On the 15th of um, August, they're not demanding an instalment on the 1st of October. They're offered demanding an instalment retrospectively back to the 1st of April. Um, in, in light of time, I think I'll move to ground. If I can move to the ground. The grounds, grounds one and two. The distinction between the two grounds being whether ground one requires st strict compliance. If that's not right, is there any limitation, timing limitation, on when notice can be given? Because the effect of the of a tribunal's decision is that time is generally at large, subject to any statutory limitation. So you can serve it at the, after the end of the year. Well, it, and it was served after the end of the year. For yeah, quite. exactly. Um, despite the fact that on its face it says you've got to serve it before the, at least a month before the year end, that's construed as meaning you can serve it after the year end. Correct. A bit difficult, that. I, I would echo that. Um, so, but stick it to the start with ground one. So that's where I say that, that we say there needs to be strict compliance. So what we're looking for is, do, do the cir other circumstances, do the circumstances of the case, case indicate that strict compliance would fulfil the party's intentions? Are there contraindications that time is to be of the essence for the purpose of this clause? And what we're dealing with is, um, of course, a provision within service charge machinery. We know there's no special approach, but there is a requirement for clarity. Um, we say it is, it, is, it is useful to have in mind what the Deputy President said in the case of London Borough of Southwark and Walkey in relation to service charge machinery, and that's to be found at tab 20 of the bundle. And um, taking from um, the judgment of the deputy, as was the deputy president, at um, paragraph 40, which is internal page 137. Is this the passage you've set out in your story? It is, oh, yeah. Um, so, if, uh, uh, paragraph 40, I've set out in my skeleton, and if, you don't need to repeat that, and the same as paragraph. So, paragraph 40 deals with. Um, how you how it, the, 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 the purpose of a lease is that the tenant can look at it and read it and understand what their obligations are without having to rely on legal advice. And the other passage from this judgment is the one referred to in the skeleton argument for the Lord of Paragraph 50, which is to deal with the function of notifying the tenant of an estimate. Two points. One is to enable the tenant to budget and two, to avoid unexpected demand. And we say that's relevant here because we have a structure the tenant knows that um, they have to put to one side £360 a year unless they are told otherwise. So that enables them to budget. And it 
the, I've already addressed you on the relevance of subclause 3, the service charge machinery. It's not part of our case. The time is of the essence for the purpose of that clause. And so the landlord isn't deprived of receiving a service charge in, in connection with its expenditure. The, the landlord's case appears to be that um, if time is not of the essence for a final charge, then in the interest of consistency within the lease, time of the essence can't be um, for the interim charge. We say that's simply not right. You're not focusing on the words of the, the clause that you're intended to construe. So what we need to do is consider what circumstances and what contraindications are there at the time, circumstances are there, what's the party's intention, or what contraindications are there. Well, first, there is the nature, of, the very nature of the provision. So it's to enable tenants to budget and avoid unexpected demands. And that dis that's different from a rent review clause, because in a rent review clause, the, the tenant can go out to the market, speak to a value, and say, what is my liability likely to be? So it can inform itself. Tenant here has no opportunity. What will be the estimate? What, what the landlord anticipates will be its expenditure in the year is a matter known only to the landlord. The tenant is wholly reliant on the notice from the um, from the landlord. And of course, in this particular case, the landlord is tenant owned. But you say, well, that needn't be the case. One, it needn't be the case, and two, it wasn't tenant owned at the date of the lease. No. And even if it had been, it wouldn't necessarily have stayed tenant owned. Correct. I, I, there may be different issues to take into consideration. Part of the relevant factor, factor of matrix might be the nature of the landlord at the time of lease, but that doesn't apply here. Yes. Um, the, the second point in terms of contraindications is the, um, is the, is the deeming provision, in the, taking the extract from Woodfall's landlord and tenant that I referred to, to um, in, in my opening. The, um, I, I was in error, I, I believe, in answer to your ladyship's question about um, when you said, well, well I'm ex my, the, the effect of my argument is to imply a deemed provision. Mm -hmm. I think the question that you, you put to me, and I was saying, well, it's a matter of construction. And, and I said, well, I actually don't see the word deemed in the clause. That's not right. Um, that's me not being right. Um, so what one can see that the word does appear in paragraph 10. So supplemental bundle. Um, first divider, page 10. Before we get excited about this, I'm not saying it says that it a, has a deeming it, effect. I mean, it is in a different context. It, it, it is in a different context, but what, but what it does is if the landlord deems it necessary. So what, what one can turn oh. that, I would respectfully say, and that if you don't receive the paragraph 10 notice, then the landlord, you, the, from the tenant's perspective, the landlord hasn't deemed it necessary. there is an imbalance here. The tenant is entirely reliant on what the landlord tells it. I've, I've got something which is bugging me, so let me let me just get it out of the way. Uh, there's a citation in your skeleton from Lord Wilberforce where he talks about breach. It's quite early on. Uh, to, to my way of thinking, we're not talking about breach at all. What, what we've got is what in other jurisdictions you might describe as a trigger. Yes. And, and one way of looking at this clause is very simple, which is if you want to trigger certain consequences, you've got to do something. Yeah. Yes. If you don't, you haven't triggered it. Why, yeah. why is it more complicated than that? Um, because the way that it was analysed by the upper tribunal was that um, if you don't, if you don't trigger it by the time, you haven't lost the opportunity to trigger it at a yeah, later know, time. But, 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 that, that doesn't follow the language of the clause. It doesn't follow that, but, but, so far as the structure of the clause is concerned, if you want a consequence to follow, you have to do something, which is serve a notice within not less than a month before. Yes. Why is it more complicated than that? I'm, my part, I'm delighted you said <laughs> simplicity. Um, I, I, I would, I would, okay, I, well, I, it may be the, other, the, the, the respondent will point out the error of my ways, but uh, uh, you should know that, that uh, speaking entirely for myself, that, that's how I read this clause at the moment. Yes. Well, I suppose Mr. Right. Warwick would say, well, that same thing could be said in the rent review context. It, it, you might similarly have a clause say that you have to trigger a rent review by a certain date for the House of Lords that 
said um, that isn't actually the case. Which is why it's important to always focus on the nature of the clause yes. and to look at what the consequences are that follow from it. And that's why I emphasise that subparagraph three, because it is not a consequence that the landlord doesn't receive a service charge. And I follow why you say that. Yes. Uh, I see Mr. Warwick would accept that what had happened here involved a breach by the landlord in the sense that he or it had not complied with the time obligation in 10 because the uh, demand for service so late. Um, but you would say, well, the fact that it's a breach doesn't mean anything. Um, uh, if the landlord can still do it. I'm not even sure it is a breach, you know, because um, uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, on the face of it, uh, looking at this, if you want something, you have to do something in order to get it. Um, and therefore, <laughs> if you want to uh, um, revise and adjust the maintenance contribution and um, uh, get payment of that, uh, you have to uh, notify... Uh, the tenant by a certain date. If you if you don't do that, you don't get it. Yes, there's a consequence for you if you do not do it. Yes, but it doesn't put you in breach of contract in the well, sense that it, you end up paying damages to somebody because you haven't complied with your obligation. No, the, 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 I, I, in, my, in, our, in my skeleton or in our skeleton, we reference the speech of Lord Wilberforce in the Bunch case, which is where your lordship is referring to. It does talk about speech, uh, to, to, does talk about breach. But in the passage that I looked at for purposes of the argument. It wasn't anchored on there being breach. It's, it's anchored on compliance with a stipulation as to time. And yeah. This is a stipulation as to time. What we're concerned with, what are the consequences if you do not comply with that? Is it that you have lost the opportunity or have you not? And I, I, it is a trigger. Yes, it is. It's, it's, um, you're going down a particular path and you move or deviate from that path if something is done. A trigger in the change in the tracks. Well, also, look, standing back and just looking at the nature of what is being claimed here, if it's an estimate, it's an estimate looking forward based on what you think you're going to expend during the year. You then tighten up the estimate by reference to actuals at the end of the year, and you get the actuals. Um, so as my Lord has said, it's, it's really a question of budgeting and cash flow. Um, if you think it is likely that you are going to expend more than the set figure which is in the lease that you can get as a minimum anyway, half yearly, um, then there is an opportunity, almost like an option. You've got the opportunity uh, to claim more in advance, but you'll get the whole sum once you've expended it. It's just a question of cash flow. Yes. Um, I, I, I hadn't used the expression option because that's one that the House of Lords sought to distance itself yes. from in terms of interpretation of revenue yeah. clauses. Um, but but a, a, absolutely, you couldn't, and I, I would respectfully add to that that all of this operates for the benefit of the landlord. Yes. It's not, it doesn't benefit the tenant. It's not like an estimate, because an, an est if you have it free of an estimate, so where you have a, quite commonly, there is a, it's more common, I would respectfully suggest, in leases that there is a fixed interim charge. So there isn't, the lease doesn't provide that you will pay a certain amount unless mm. a certain machinery is operated. It's rather the landlord will inform you what it anticipates it will expend. Here is our estimate, and here is your, um, here is your liability. And there, the estimate, this is what the Deputy President was saying in Walkie, why the landlord couldn't waive mm. the contractual requirements of an estimate is because it operates for the benefit of both. Mm. Because the tenant then knows what he needs to budget, how it's not going to be hit with an unexpected demand. Whereas here, what we're dealing with is something that is solely for the benefit of the landlord. Mm. Um, if I perhaps move then quite relatively swiftly through through this, you, you, it's then the, the interpretation that requires strict compliance is consistent with the language. You have the, the expression not less than, which is in contradistinction to the other expressions, the time stipulation within the service charge machinery that we briefly looked at. And it's also about the time for payments, because there's a time for payment on stipulated dates. If you start saying, well, you can serve a, a paragraph 10 notice at a different time, you do not know when you pay. You do not know what you pay. And that is contrary to the, all of the case law that said, well, look, if the landlord is looking for an obligation um, on the task of the tenant to pay something other than rent, it must be clearly stated. The extent of the obligation must be clearly stated. And objectively, what, what, one says, well, why have they fixed the time? Well, it's not surprising. It enables the tenant to then arrange their affairs so that they can meet that obligation on the 1st of April. It is of no use to a tenant to be told on the 31st of March, I'm moving it from £360 to £1,500. And moreover, what are the consequences to a tenant who does not comply with those payments?
they are exposed to the risk of forfeiture. So, for, for, for all of those reasons, we say that the circumstances of this clause are such that it was clear that it was the intention of the party that there be strict compliance. And, and just to be clear, since I haven't checked this bit, when the demand is served in August 2019, it's on the basis that everything bar the, the last couple of bits are already due. Well, it, it's the first time for payment of an, in, of an interim charge beyond £360. But it, it isn't looking forward to future... No, correct. It's all, a re, in, re, in each respect, it operates retrospectively. You, you, could, and, you could and arguably should by then have had your maintenance charge contributed, um, calculated, because it's all, re, it's all in the past. Yeah. So, sorry, my was Well, as, as I understand the, the provisions about the maintenance charge, the idea is that the maintenance charge is calculated and claimed up to soon, up to very soon after the end of the year. Correct. The year. So, the, the so these first two year periods, they should be. There's no reason why they, that we know of, why they shouldn't have been already claimed as maintenance charge. Correct, and that would have avoided the whole argument about an interim charge because right. they would have just said, "Here's your liability for the final charge. You didn't pay anything on the either nothing or anything more than three hundred and sixty pounds, and therefore there is a credit due on, as you say." Um, Lord's maintenance charge. So that, that, that protection was there for the landlord. And, and I haven't thought this through either. The, the other uh, disputes we have in this case in relation to grounds three and four, would they have an impact on whether the landlord could already have finalised the service charge claim for these years? Ground whether it could have finalised. I mean, my, one reason why the landlord hadn't finalised its service charge, be that it had outstanding issues otherwise? Um, well, it, it, it can't, it couldn't affect, it, it can't have been its intention not to do it to avoid a waiver, because if, if there's going to be an act of waiver, then you have that by demanding on the 15th of August 2019. Yeah. So it can't have objectively been to avoid a waiver. Um, in terms of resolution <laughs> on ground three, those are concerned with costs of earlier tribunal proceedings, so a finding on this doesn't affect um, in so far as ground four, then there are costs of these, proceedi of these proceedings to deal with those interim charges that we say are not recoverable through the service charge. But they could have stuck them into their mm. final maintenance charge certified appropriately, and then you could have had the argument about it. Correct. Correct. And then we would have still said that's, that's not it. Because it still, it still focuses on, is it a charge captured by Schedule 7? Yes. Same but recast without the strict time of the essence, but correct but taking account of the provisions of the lease. Yes, and so but th then it's a question of well, where does one draw the line? And there, there, there's a number of different options. One is you don't draw you don't draw a line, or you draw the line at the year end, or you draw the line at the second instalment, or you draw the line at the beginning of the financial year. And Judge Cook, although obviously she takes a view generally time is not of the essence of these provisions, has herself adopted a ground mm -hmm. two type position in a case as I understand it. Correct. So that was the London Borough of Southwark and Actar. Now in that case, so the, the local authority had a right to ask for a, a payment on account. And the if exercised, then the landlord was the tenant, sorry, was required to pay that by four quarterly installments, not on the usual quarter days, but on four quarterly payments. And the last of which was the first of January in the financial year. And the tenant and the landlord did not give its notice until after the first of January, so after the final instalment date. And Judge Cook in that case said, "Well, that that can't be right." 
justification or a reasoning for saying it can't be after the last um, quarterly data is because the landlord's got the opportunity to do the, the, the balancing exercise, the actuals yeah. and, the, and the, the estimates. Is it worth just taking us very briefly? Yes, please. That? Yes, please. So, so that's the case of um, Sullivan and Edinburgh Sullivan and um, Edinburgh Sullivan Actors, Tab 29. So you don't go so far as to say it should have been the first of October. Well, I go earlier. I, I say because it's because it's an advance oh. notification. It has to be given before the start of the year. What I'm saying is, if you if you don't serve it on the give me the 28th of February, yes. one month. But if you serve on the 3rd of March, yeah. On ground two, that would be permissible. I don't say that's the right answer. The right answer is ground one. You have to do it, it by the 28th of March. Forgive me. Would it be? It, 
Is it permissible in relation to what you claim on the 1st of April, or just in relation to what you claim on the 1st of October? It, it would operate for the 1st of April. On ground two, it would. I, I, I don't say that's the right interpretation. No, no, no. Clear. Because it doesn't work, because you run into that problem. You, you run into trouble if you serve in the middle of the financial year. Or, or the 31st of March. Or the 31st of March. That's the problem. And so it, 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 it doesn't give effect to that buffer, that period, that buffer period that the parties have expressly referred to. Not less than one month, not language used in relation to other time stipulations. I suppose a different way of putting ground two is even if you say, well, it, it doesn't require, time is not of the essence, it's a trigger and it falls under a different consideration. You might say, well, that doesn't make out ground one, but then for the purpose of ground two, I would say that the latest time it can be given is one month before the start of the year. Seems to come to exactly the same thing. Okay. But for different reasons. Yeah. Um, if I may move to ground three. Um, the, uh, in our skeleton argument, we referred to, um, forgive me before I move on from ground one and two, in our skeleton argument, we referred to a case called um, Leonora Mo um, Mo McDonald. And we referred to it both the first instance when, when Mr. Warwick was involved and also to observations of Lord Justice Tucky in the Court of Appeal. You have the citations in my skeleton argument. They, they make way to the points that we've already made about it not being sensible to be able to serve a notice after the start of the financial year, an estimate after the start of the financial year. Um, and then as regards to Lord Justice Tucky in the Court of Appeal, it was, well, it, it would be a, a surprising construction if time was so was generally at large so that you could serve a demand six years later. But you have those citations in our skeleton. Um, so unless I can see any of you any further on grounds one and two. Um, ground three. Let me, we, we, forgive me if I try and take this in a way that doesn't repeat some of the issues that we've already explored when we were looking at the clause. Um, I think it, it, what, what I would submit is it's important to keep in mind that there is a limitation to the indemnity. It's not, it's not a general indemnity, it's restricted restricted to costs incurred for the purposes and preparation of service of a notice, or incidental to and preparation and service of a notice. And that's, so, and that's why um, we say it makes, I know I'm putting this up, but it makes no reference to the word proceedings. Um, here it would be worth looking at, worthwhile looking at the lease and some of the other clauses just to see the purposes of an iterative approach to the interpretation that the word proceedings does appear elsewhere. So in connection with the tenant's obligation from covenants, um, so we're in Schedule 4, um, paragraph 12, which is page 21 of the supplemental manual. Yep. <clears throat> so um, that, that is uh, uh, an indemnity given by the tenant to the landlord in the event that the tenant fails to comply with the provisions of the Town and Country Planning Act. And the breadth of the indemnity is to be found in the last three lines of the clause. And it, it extends to actions, proceedings, damages, penalties. Yeah, it's a classic indemnity clause, that. A absolutely, but for our purposes, it includes the word proceedings. Yeah. And that's echoed in the clause below, paragraph 13. Paragraph 13 is to, deals with the situation where the tenant applies for planning permission to carry out work. And in the event that it obtains planning permission and they implement that planning permission, then there's an indemnity. And it's Sorry, which clause is this? It's paragraph 13, my lady. And the scope of the indemnity yes. is at the bottom. Yes. It's in similar terms, yep. if not identical to this. And um, the omission of the word proceedings is, uh, I've foreshadowed this, is, is to be contrasted um, with, one can't obviously take a, a, a do an exhaustive review of every single lease provision appeared in the cases, but the, um, a Judge Cook, um, very useful if I must respectfully say, um, tabulated the provisions that have appeared in the cases that um, she considered. So that's within her, her decision in this case, uh, which is a tab 8 of the uh, appeal bundle. 
and so there, um, what you, the, the exercise that Judge Cook usually say carries out is to reduce that tab table um, in addition to our page. This is paragraph 64. I beg your pardon, yes, 64, Lord, yes. So page 108 of the bundle um, recites the clauses to be found in other cases. The first, so the first one is 69 Marina. Um, second one is a uh, case of Baron Robinson, the first one. Third one, the case of Willins. Um, each of those had within the scope of the clause the cost of the 146 proceedings. Um, it, it, you can see in, in contrast. Sorry, so, so that's 69 Marina and Willins, and you said another one as well. And Barrett, the middle one, the Lord. So you see it um, in contemplation proceedings. Um, it, it, yes. it, there is also reference to proceedings in contract real, or bills. So contract real, copy the case of tab 12. Tab 12 is the case of contract real and dates. about the, the words that were used in all those various clauses is that um, incurred in or in contemplation of proceedings um, is used as an, as an extra, if you like, um, to the solicitor's fees and surveyor's fees um, incurred by the landlord. So uh, in those leases, at least, um, the solicitor's fees and surveyor's fees incurred by the landlord incidental to the preparation of the service of a notice under section 146 um, does not include those costs. But of course that's understandable because at the time when those leases were drafted, presumably, it was before the changes and the proceedings would have, been, would have inevitably have come after a section 146 notice and not before. Or is that wrong in I terms of timetable? I would just before answering that affirmatively, I just want to quickly check the date of the because if there's a, if there's a, if there's a later lease, then it does and it does add a little to your argument, doesn't it? So, um, although of course they wouldn't be proceedings under section one four six or one four seven anyway, they'd be proceedings. So the. The lease in Six Nine Marina was 1985. Yeah. Um, Barrett, I need to ask um, Mr. Blakeney, don't have that case um, in, in the bundle. Um, in terms of uh, Willens, Mr. Blakeney's just going to answer yeah. that question. Yeah. Um, contract real certainly to ch uh, predated the, yeah. uh, the changes. 
But the, where, where we would respectfully say um, Judge Cook fell into error is that she's just treating all the clauses the same without identifying the distinction in the language used. Mm. And overlooking the distinction in the language used means that you're not turning your mind to the question of identifying what the intention of the parties were. The, um, we, we've already, um, I think, I can assist you further on this, but sort of identified some of the changes in the legislative framework for, for forfeiture in terms of the place of um, the notice, the pro place of the determination of breach in the process. Um, but that was considered to the, um, the legislative framework as it existed at the time of the lease, when it wasn't necessary to first get a determination of breach before we serve the 146 notice, was relevant to the exercise of interpretation in a number of cases. Um, one, of, one of which is uh, Gayford's and O'Sullivan, which is a tab 26. Concerned with was it once again the recovery of legal costs through a service charge? So it's interpreting a service charge provision. Tab which? I beg pardon, it's gated in order. Tab 26. 26, I'm so sorry. Apologies. And at paragraph 45, decision of the Deputy President. The Deputy President identifies what the position was, the process that would have ought to have been gone through at the time in relation to exercising the right of forfeiture. So is this, a, is this a lease which was executed before the changes to the law? Correct. And then is being interpreted in the light of the fact that there are now the changes to Correct. the law? Correct. Yes. Different clause. It's yes. a clause within the service charge regime. Yeah. Paragraph 45, personally. Thank you. 
implication of paragraph 6 that the longer before the change in the law the lease was executed, the more appropriate it may be to have regard to the, uh, the statutory framework at the time. Yes, because otherwise you're making assumptions as to yeah. what was known. Yeah. To be comfortable 20 years before a legislative change, it wasn't within the contemplation of the past. So that's exactly right. So, um, so in answer to Mr. Warwick's position, if you were trying to uh, interpret leases that were executed around the margins of legislative change, then you wouldn't give to them. In the words um, of the Judge Bridge, that those considerations would attract limited weight. You might wish that they had clarified their position, but you wouldn't make those assumptions. Yeah. The, I trust that you have one point about it hasn't, that the, the changes introduced the, through the Housing Act of 1996 hasn't added an additional requirement to the underlying cause of action. You still have to establish breach to the right of re-entry. Um, put, it's a point I've already made, perhaps put it a different way. By their language, the parties agreed that the tenant would not uh, be contractually liable for the landlord's costs of all stages of the forfeiture process. And that's because they've admitted the proceeding. So unlike those other cases, the tenant has said, I contractually will, not to give it a legal expression, but just for ease of reference, indemnify you for all of your costs of, a, of the forfeiture process. That is not the position here. And um, the fact that those proceedings are now conducted in a largely cost-free jurisdiction doesn't really alter the analysis. Because um, if you're saying now, well, they, the, the clause is to, is to be read as capturing proceedings, is to rewrite or alter the party's bargain. Now, the landlord may wish to do that with the benefit of hindsight, which was that passage in Arnold and Britain, but that's not permissible. Well, I was thinking about Arnold and Britain when um, you, you took us to these cases which directly, albeit in a different context, because it's trying to recoup through the service charge rather than this way, um, seem to be in keeping with the approach in Arnold and Britain, which is unless you can say that if you'd said to the parties at the time, what would happen if, and they would have both said, of course, you'd be able to recoup those pre those costs, it, then, it, then you don't interpret the co contract that way. Correct, because there's two points. One is that um, in that, it's the sixth of the seven factors, yeah. Lord Newberger talks about it, it's clearly their intention. They yeah. absolutely need clarity. Um, I think that's point one. And then point two, as you say, it's, it's, it's a common intention. And that, I think, is that it, it comes, and I am echoing a point now again, that comes back because previously it was, well, I will, um, there, there's, a, there's a, a position of equivalence because the parties said costs will be left to the courts. It could go our way, it could go their way. Whereas there isn't a position of equivalence now. So would a tenant have said, you know what, I can't recover my costs, but I'm fully prepared to pay all of your costs? Mm. That can, we cannot, it's either clearly was, wouldn't have been their intention or we can't be satisfied that it clearly would be their intention. There is, a, there is another oddity about it, is that um, these changes are introduced for the benefit of tenants. It's to protect tenants against the draconian effects of forfeiture. It's part of a legislative scheme that's coming over a number of years. I, I would hesitate to say when it first started, but it's certainly around in the late 19th century when there was a requirement to serve what is now a 146 notice. Um, but it, it's an increasingly an, encro it, it's an encroachment on the landlord's remedy to introduce steps that they need to go through for the benefit of the tenant. And it would be a surprising interpretation, I would suggest, we would suggest, that where you have a clause which makes no reference to the proceedings, to then find that a protection that's been given by Parliament in respect to proceedings doesn't benefit the tenants under this lease because of a contractual provision entered into 20 years earlier. Say that once more. So Parliament has come, so the, the clause makes no reference to proceedings. Parliament has introduced some benefit, a, a, a right, a benefit to the tenant, which is to say the, the, the proceedings as to breach, the determination of breach, now takes place in a largely cost-free jurisdiction. That's going to operate for the benefit of the tenant. It would be a surprising interpretation to say, well, a lease granted 20 years ago deprives a tenant of that benefit. It would deprive the tenant of that benefit because it doesn't get the benefit of the cost-free jurisdiction. 
farmers intended because it said that this contract requires them to pay the landlord's cost. It's, it's another way of saying that if, um, although as a matter of public policy there's no prohibition against a contract which would um, make the tenant reimburse the landlord's cost, notwithstanding that he can't get it through the mechanism of the tribunal situation, he can, as a matter of contract he could still be made to pay it, it ought to be done explicitly. Um, uh, because otherwise you're depriving him of the protection which Parliament has intended he should have. As a matter of policy, absolutely yeah. right. If you want to take that protection away, you've got to spell it out. Yes, well, and, and to put it in the way you lay should put it, you have to be satisfied it was clearly the intention of the parties that you wouldn't have that benefit. Which you can't be if it was in a lease that's 20 years earlier that hasn't necessarily anticipated... Well, which is what, why I put it that way, because if that yeah. the answer to your latest question, which is you need to spell it out, is like I wouldn't begin to suggest they ought to have spelled that out in 1982. No, no. So what we're trying to do is identify what clearly would be their intention as to how... But even under the current regime, I mean, suppose you were dealing with a lease now um, that was entered into in the, un, under the current regime. I mean, th there would be certainly an argument, wouldn't there? that if, uh, given that the Parliament's intention is that there should be a largely cost-free environment, you still need to spell out uh, um, uh, fairly clearly a right to recover those costs. You, you do, and as time has gone on, one is you start seeing broader indemnity clauses, so it's yeah. not an indemnity for cost of proceedings of 1.6, it's actually an indemnity for the cost of in connection with a breach, in yeah. relation to a breach, or enforcement action in relation to a breach. And then more recently, you actually find um, what you, you begin to find is um, cost of tribunal proceedings are explicitly referenced in whichever provision it might be, whether it's a service charge provision or whether it's in a administration charge of direct cost yeah. liability between tenants and landlords. Okay. Have I got this right? I'm just trying to formulate it in my own mind. My, my lady's formulation is very clear. But uh, uh, what you're saying is in a lease executed well before the cost free environment, when, like this one, there was no need to re imply recovery of costs because there was a cost-bearing environment, and so they would be catered for. Uh, no, because leases did did uh, expressly encapsulate. They costs might be expressly. They might do. They might but do. I'm looking at the implication. Yes. So um, what one has to do is where I, I, I put in my mind is that we're trying to identify their intention. What intention can we? What can we draw as to their intention from the omission of the word proceeding? The intention that we can draw, we submit, is that they that the question, the incidence of cost, is to be left to the proceedings in which the dispute is to be played out. Okay. It I wasn't to be the subject of a contractual arrangement. I think, I think I'm proceeding crabwise towards the same position. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies.
liability of landlords costs of tribunal proceedings under, under a cost clause, a 146 clause, that is worded differently to ours. The clause is to be found at par bottom of paragraph 2 on page 37. I see the I see the ambiguity. So you, you you say that she doesn't she doesn't mean that it it covers circumstances where a notice hasn't been served under section one four six, but it's not limited to circumstances in which it has. Yes, because she's saying the scope of the clause is, goes further because and although it's not in that wording, it's because it also picks up in contemplation of proceedings. Yeah. Yes, that's um, so. And one can see that when one gets to the circuit judge's judgment of paragraph eight. And you'll see there's recite re reference there to paragraph 10 of his judgment. Yes, that's clear. Yeah. So then when it comes to the second appeal, you at paragraph 21. The district judge considered the matter of time before it one four six notice been served. This accounts for a conclusion that six of a judgment of the decision of the circuit judge at ten. Whilst neither of them spelled out the exact nature of the liability of the lessee in three twelve, there is no doubt as to their conclusions. I agree with them. I mean, that doesn't fit with way. what you said, does it? No. He's reading it the other way. He is, well, he is but he's also. But what he's, it is perfectly clear that what was being said at first instance, the second, what was being said at the first appeal was that the, the original decision was one on. In contemplation of proceedings, that's clear from what Judge. I say that's right if you follow the wording of paragraph six of Judge Nightingale's decision, and it's endorsed by what Judge Hollis said. The, but I'm not sure how far this is going to matter when we're concerned with what the Court of Appeal said. But uh, Sir Andrew Morris is reading what the district judge says as dealing with the fact that no section 146 notice has been served. Well, she was giving a judgment at a time where no 146 yes. hasn't been. Given. And she's saying, well, the clause doesn't only require. The, the clause can apply even when no notice has yet been served. Yeah, well, well 
what I would submit working back. Why it becomes relevant is because it is the race, where we get to is, is the ratio of the case that the costs are recoverable because they're offered incidental to a notice, or is the ratio of the case because they're of in contemplation? I, I mean, I see the importance of the question, but uh, I'm not quite sure that looking what the district, well, we'll see. What did the Court of Appeal say? <laughs> well, so that's the Court of Appeal saying, I agree with the conclusions of the district judge and the circuit judge. And then, paragraph The conclusions 20. being, uh, just to, to nail this point down, that whether or not, um, when the district judge said it doesn't pertain only in circumstances where a notice has been served, she means um, anywhere a notice has been, uh, it, it's not limited to that, or it, it doesn't necessarily have to have been served yet. The real ratio is it's the it's the, the clause that the, they're incidental to dealing with the proceedings because this is a particular clause which specifically talks about proceedings. That's what I'm trying in eloquent. That's what you're trying, trying to, get to draw to. out. Yeah. And one and, and now if one then goes back to the conclusions of paragraph twenty. In the circumstances, the district judge was right to have concentrated on the terms of clause three twelve and then recites the two parts of three twelve. Given that the determination of the tribunal in the sense of section 146 notice are cumulative, cumulative conditions pressing to enforcement of the lessee's liability for the freeholder's cost of repair or service charge, it is, in my view, clear that the freeholder's costs before the tribunal fall within terms of clause 312. If, and insofar as any of them may not have been strictly cost of the proceedings, they appear to have been incidental to the preparation of the requisite notice to be scheduled. So the ratio of what I say is the ratio of the case is that they're captured by in contemplation of proceedings. And any, the reference to if and so far as is a clear indication that, with reference to the notice, it's open terms. Sorry, it's the last bit again. Well, the, the, I can't ignore the fact that he does say that in so they would also be captured by the notice, but that's not the ratio of the case because it's in so far as they're not captured by that. Yes, I see. <clears throat> Isn't it? Subordinate cost to the cost of the action. 
Um, what, here, what was sought was a declaration as to the amount of service charges that were paid. Uh, court proceedings for a declaration. And um, the first argument was that, um, that, that they were uh, an argument that they were cost of proceedings was rejected. So you recall clause nine, you see the clause, and you recall that this clause goes beyond, as, as it's summarised in the table by Judge Brooks, it also includes cost of proceedings. And at paragraph 33, dealing with the construction of the clause, in my judgment, the judge was right, these proceedings are not themselves proceedings for declarations of the amount of payable um, are not themselves proceedings for the recovery of rent. They are proceedings for a declaration to the amount of the service charge, which was, under the lease, to be treated as part of rent and constituted rent. So then you have the alternative argument, which begins at paragraph 34, that the costs are of an incidental to the preparation and service of proceedings. That phrase would seem to to um, be apt to include little more than the drafting of the original application and any witness statements. In paragraph 35, Ms. Hegarty has two further submissions. She submits the cost of these proceedings were incidental to future proceedings for the recovery of rent. If this argument right, it would enable all the costs that have been incurred to be claimed by the landlord's contract real under this clause and require them to be assessed on a indemnity basis. In paragraph 36, the answer. It seems to me that there are several answers to this point. Firstly, if the whole of the cost were cost incidental to the cost of the preparation of the proceedings for the recovery of rent, it would be as it seems to me, a case of tail wagging the dog. Normally, the natural meaning of the word incidental is to denote a lesser or subordinate sum, whereas on this argument, the incidental costs are very substantial and some indeed. What then, um, Lady Justice Arndt does, uh, proceeds to consider a number of cases at paragraphs 37, 38, 39, and 40, and she draws the conclusions together at 41. So these authorities show that the expression of an incidental to is a time hallowed phrase in the context of costs and it has received a limited meaning, and in particular the words incidental to have been treated as denoted some subordinate cost to the cost of the action. If Ms. Hegarty was right in this action, it would mean that the cost of some very substantial proceedings would be treated as cost of and incidental to other proceedings. So the relevance of this is that if in 69 Marina the court was considering or made a finding that the costs were recoverable under that part of the clause, which covered costs of an incidental to the preparation of the 146 notice, before reaching that finding, it was necessary to look at and consider the court's earlier decision in contract real. Because that case identifies a restricted meaning to those, that hallowed phrase. We say that what contract real says is that the, um, that expression is to identify costs that are subordinate to or of a lesser sum than the thing to which they are incidental to. Yeah, I'm not so sure how far you can push the lesser sum point, but it's the subordinate nature. Uh, in, the, the word incidental um, means that it's got to be of a subordinate nature. Um, I mean, it, we don't know, do we, if Aiden Shipping and Interbalt was cited in um, 69 Marina either? Uh, we, uh, I mean, the, 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 in so far as we've got a judgment, it doesn't recite any no. cases. Uh, and so, uh, the, the, the one one doesn't get here if 69 Marina is a decision that is not already to contemplation of proceedings. But if one goes to the next step and says, well, actually, it's a decision that they're recoverable of an incidental to, what we say would have been relevant to refer to contract real. Had there been a reference to contract real, we say the decision in 69 Marina on that aspect would have been different. It wouldn't have changed the result because it would have still been of any contemplation of proceedings. But it would have led to a different decision, we say, on that second el secondary element, which is cost being of an incidental to the notice. Well, that's on the assumption that you're wrong on your interpretation of what the secondary element is referring to anyway. Correct. I, it's necessary to address this because it is so. Yes. So, so that's I can assist you any further on ground three. I've moved yep. to ground four. Oh yes, before I move on, my lady, my Mr. Blake has been extremely useful. Um, as he has throughout the case. Um, Barrett is April 1991. 
release. Uh, Willens um, doesn't record the date. Um, contract real is October 98. Jess, hang on. I'll beg your pardon. The Willens doesn't say the date. No, Barish is April which? Uh, in 91, my lord. Thank you. Sorry. Willens, we Willens no date. Doesn't refer to the date. No. Contract real, October 98. <laughs> 69 Marina, July 85. So see, I don't think any of it matters, but you could have extra complications where, as here, the landlord has covenanted to require tenants, future tenants, to enter into the same covenant. Um, uh, so even if a lease were granted years on, presumably it would have to include the same term. Yes, and again, not to get distracted, the real problem with Rafa, that is a problem. A, a, another problem is when they go for a lease extension under the Lease on Reform and Night Sticks yes. Act, because the starting point is the lease as per the original tenancy. Yeah. And so you then walk into the word, wording of Section 56, which gives a restriction as to how you can play around with the wording of the lease. I really wouldn't wish to explore that. But I don't think any of that's here to help us here. Um, ground four. So we're concerning ourselves with the wording of um, Schedule 7, Paragraph 5, which is at page 31 of the Supplemental Bundle. To, what is being said by the landlord is that its costs of tribunal proceedings to obtain a determination of the amount of service charge payable by a tenant clear, uh, belongs, belongs within that clause. I use that expression because, of course, that brings us back to what um, Lord Newberger said in Arnold of Britain that you, you, you only bring within the uh, clause costs that clearly belong there. So, our question, the question we're asking is, um, are, are these costs, do these costs clearly belong within this clause? And what we say is that this clause is concerned um, with the provision of management services. Yeah. And we say um, that is echoed by number one, West India Key. Um, we say that is consistent with what Lord Justice Taylor said in Seller House. Is the right to recover those costs expressed in clear and unambiguous terms? That test remains relevant, as we've seen recently in West India Key, the increasing endorsement of West India Key. It is perhaps of note that in relation to this um, particular issue, um, Judge Cook, in um, giving her decision, so that's at um, main, main Appeal Bundle. Have eight. At paragraph ninety-five. So paragraph ninety-five is is um, her expressions of a conclusion on this particular issue, so go to ground four. And quite openly she recognises that she found the construction of this clause to be difficult. What is the and that, there's no criticism of that. What, but what, why, is, why is that significant? Significant because it, it tells that the language isn't expressed in clear and unambiguous terms. Mm. If it was, there would be no difficulty in its construction. The Take, if one takes that step further, insofar as there is ambiguity, then wait to be given to common sense, business common sense. And if one applies business common sense to the clause, um, what was said in Gateford by the Deputy President is telling. So Gateford is at tap 26. 
consideration engagement, another case where recovery, as I say, is a case of recovery, vandals costs of tribunal proceedings with service charge. The clause is to be found at the top of internal page 7. All other expenses incurred by the lessors or their managing agents in or about and about the maintenance and proper convenient management and running of the development. The Deputy President referred himself to the um, Seller House case. Um, and paragraph 38, so internal page 10. Expressed, the Deputy President expressed himself finding it less obvious that proceedings to enforce the obligation of an individual leaseholder to make payment to the landlord fell naturally within the scope of management and running for the clause. Then there's the reference to Seller House. Then over the page, he identifies why he refers to it, the top of page 11. I refer to Seller House not for how the language of that lease struck the Court of Appeal, but because it illustrates the improbability that parties to a lease would regard general words as sufficient to express an intention that any shortfall in the landlord's cost of litigation between them should be a charge on the whole body of leaseholders. So that picks up on the point of business common sense, if, if there is ambiguity in the language. Um, relevant to the, um, we, we've already looked in Gaithford's at the relevant legislative um, framework at the time of the lease, at paragraph 45 and 46. Um, and if we say that the legal costs of proceedings aren't captured by the, like this clause, and the change in the legislation can't change that interpretation. That would be to rewrite the bargain. The, what we say is also supported for our interpretation is the language and structure. I've, I've missed something. Sorry, what? In, in, in this case, I, I'm just, it's just a reference to an intention that shortfall and land footballs costs of litigation between them should be charged on the whole body of leaseholders. So it was the submission that the, uh, the shortfall in the landlord's costs should be spread amongst all the leaseholders. Because it, because it was a service charge expenditure, because yes. it was said it was So it came into the calculation of the overall service charge, which was then divided between the leaseholders. Correct, which is the position here. So what we're looking at is, uh, as you rightly pointed out to me, Rod, it's the cost the landlord occurs on the matter specified in the seventh schedule. Or we're looking at the matter in the special seventh schedule. So what's being said yeah. by the landlord's item yeah. and money on litigating against you, and I say, as a landlord, it's recoverable under clause five. And if it's right, it's recoverable um, through the service charge of all tenants who've come and um, Is that why the, the sums in the demand, the 15th of August demand, are in absolute terms quite small? Because they're just a proportion. Uh, well, that's proportion. Yes, because they're my clients. Proportion. Made the correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank the, you. Uh, I mean, we've discussed before the the significance or lack of it of the fact that this is a tenant owned landlord. Um, but if you're right, um, this could all get quite difficult for tenant owned companies um, because they quite properly incur, uh, well, even if they don't properly, they incur expenditure. Um, their only asset typically would be the freehold. Um, so, so what you do, you sell the freehold in order to meet the cost. Well, so um, there's, a num well, um, there's a number of ways to, to, to resolve that. One is because the, the, the tenants to have acquired is likely to be through a collective enfranchisement. So they've got control, of, and one of the functions of a collective enfranchisement is to grant new leases, to provide new leases. And that's why you pay marriage value, or can pay marriage value, depending on how many, the amplifier term is of the lease at the time of the enfranchisement. It's not going there, but the point is that they can re that there is an opportunity for them to to rewrite the lease. I accept that doesn't apply, of course, if somebody's not a participating tenant in the collective enfranchisement. Um, uh, the, the second point is, is that there can be, if a company is set up by tenants, then it can be recoverable through the, could be recoverable through the Articles of Association. You have the Malton Mansion and the Marco case, where it was said that even though you couldn't recover it through the cost of recovery through the service charge, yeah. it may not be recoverable because of the legislative intervention with reasonableness or limitation or compensation, but you could recover it qua company and shareholder. Um, there is a decision, I would need to find a case, there is a decision where Martin, um, the Deputy President Martin Roger says that the identity of the landlord, even a lessee run company, is not relevant. To the well, company. I can see that, sir. Uh, and, and of course, as you pointed out, this landlord originally wasn't a no. tenant owned company. But one can see that saying to a tenant owned company that they can't recover from the tenants shortfall 
could potentially create problems. Um, yes, sorry. sorry. Uh, the, um, it, it, it could cause difficulty, and again, I mean, this is an observation of, of just the, based on experience and practice, is that you have recital clauses in leases where the tenant is a, where the landlord is a tenant owned management company that says it's the intention that the landlord should fully recover all of its expenses. That informs then as to the exercise of the interpretation. Which is fine. If it's turned down from the start, the, 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 the problem, which is it, it, the, the, the problem, the difficulty is, if you, it simply is what happens when post grant the tenants acquire the freehold and they're stuck with the lease that was granted in the 1970s and 1980s. Yes. Um, an answer to that might be to take advice as to what the consequences are of. Well, actually, there's a number of answers. Point one is take advice before you take on a least with obligations and see what, whether you can recover, you can indemnify yourself. Point two is if you can't function, you can apply for a appointment for manager, and then the tribunal's got jurisdiction to um, frame what the tenants are required to pay. So, um, and that's not a procedure I know much about. Uh, so, just hang on. Um, so, you've got a landlord with a short. If the landlord can't, if the landlord can't. Can't perform, then it is possible to go to, and so it's not able to perform its management function. It is possible under our, one of the parts of the 1987 Act, either part two or part one of the parts of the Landlord Tenant Act 1987, and the tribunal can appoint a manager. Yes, yes, yes. Which is that's just point, enormously expensive. But. Yes, but it's, it's trying to, because there's a practical point, which is how does, because what lies, I've what I prefer lies behind the question is how to manage the building if you can't yes, identify it. Yes. I, I mean, I, I, I come back to the point that it's, it's not an inquiry. It is, it is a problem that needs to be resolved. It's not a problem relevant to this case. And, and I can see that. Just following, pursuing it a moment longer, because we've got a moment. Um, so the, the tribunal appoints a manager, and then there can be. Tri the tribunal frames the, the obligations. There's a recent case on. Um, I think it's concerned Alford House. Right. To do with how you draw, how, how you, how the, how the, the obligation, the, the powers, the powers of the manager, how they're framed. And the starting point is the lease, but the powers derive from the tribunal's order. And it is a way of improving deficiencies in the lease. There was a judge decision of um, Judge Bridge, I think, from the other tribunal on the point of the manager, which says that this scheme can be used to correct or get around or avoid deficiencies in the lease because the tribunal can bespoke what the management obligations are, what the management functions are, and how the manager is funded. So it's you can impose new financial obligations. Effectively, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not an answer because I, I can see that emotively it is not an answer because you are then taking management away from the people who have sought to acquire the free right. Of course, I can do that. But that is a consequence of construing the lease at the time that it was granted. Yes. Which is the correct approach. Say is that going back, returning from a, I mean, go back to the interpretation of that clause. Um, when, when trying to identify a scope, it's relevant in an application of the interest process to look at what words, the language used in other aspects or other elements of the lease, other obligations. We know that there's reference in the um, section 146 clause to solicitors' costs. You know, we've, that's the clause we've been looking at for the purpose of round three. Um, that's repeated in. Um, so in Schedule 7, tenants' obligations, it's repeated in paragraph 6, subparagraph 4, page 19. So that subclause, clause, so Schedule 4, paragraph 6, subparagraph 4, is to deal with the obligations of a tenant when there's been an alienation. And as is common, you, you register the alienation with the, the landlord, 
and as it's called, you pay a, a, a fee, a registration fee. There you see express reference to the um, solicitors. Similarly, um, if one goes to uh, paragraph 20, you have a, a, an indemnity provision, or a, sort of indemnity provision, but a, a, a contractual liability provision, paragraph 20, um, to pay the landlord's expenses um, incurred in granting any consent under the lease. And again, there's reference to the solicitor's cost. Um, you then have the absence in our clause of any reference to proceedings, and I've already taken you to where we see in the lease elsewhere reference to proceedings. The clause in um, indemnifying for breach of the Town and Country Planning Act or uh, an indemnity um, on implementation of any planning commission. Um, we then have, we already perhaps looked at some of them, is the more expansive indemnity provision elsewhere. It's all costs, all proceedings, all expenses. That expansive use of language for purposes of indemnification is found in clause 5. The illustrations of that are at page um, 22, paragraph 16b. There it's an indemnity. Um, failure to keep the property in repair, so it's 16b at page 22, there the tenant is agreeing to indemnify the landlord against all liability costs expenses incurred by the landlord um, in respect of a failure by the tenant to keep the flat in repair or a failure to comply with the preceding subparagraph which is to notify the landlord of wants of repair for which it, the landlord is responsible. So you have an expansive use of expression there um, as you do also um, in So, yeah, sorry, that, that, so you have a use of exp expansive expression there. Um, then you have also um, reference to enforcement action. You have a structure for enforcement. You have a structure of enforcement, um, one, by the recipro reciprocity of obligation under Clause 4. We've seen that where the tenant covenants not only with the landlord in re as regards the service charge machinery, it also covenants with the leaseholders. So there is a structure for enforcement. Moreover, there's a structure for enforcement under the landlord's obligations under the sixth schedule, paragraph three, which is at page 27. Which is what is perhaps commonly referred to as a mutual enforceability covenant. So where the what? landlord covenant on what? A mutual enforceability covenant. I can manage that. Okay. Thank you. Whereas the landlord says, well, I'll enforce the covenants of uh, another lessee if you put me in funds. So the point is, is that when one, the, the, the submission is that when one looks at the wording of paragraph five, if one doesn't see solicitors, one doesn't see proceedings, it isn't concerned with enforcement action. There's a structure for enforcement action elsewhere in the lease. Mr. Warwick may say that, well, the words in connection with, as used in paragraph five, are sufficiently wide, clear, and unambiguous to capture the costs of those early tribunal proceedings, capture the costs of tribunal proceedings. But if that is right, but if it is right, it, it's very difficult to see where the, the limit of costs to which the clause applies lies. Where, where do you stop? If tribunal proceedings are being, are capable of being characterised as costs in connection with management, then really that could be the same could be said for the majority, if not all, of the paragraphs that are individually expressed in Schedule 7. And if, if that's right, it effectively renders redundant Schedule 7. But having gone through the exercise of identifying separately over a significant number well, of paragraphs... you just need to say you can recover the maintenance charge all costs incurred in connection with the management of the property. Full stop, and that's it. That is Schedule 7. If, if Mr. Warwick is right that the, that wording is sufficiently wide, or sufficiently clear and unambiguous to capture legal fees. Um, there, there are two of the cases, um, perhaps you don't need to look at in detail, but two, two of the cases have been cited. One is Asset Hold Watts, tab 23, and the other is Sinclair Investment Kensington Limited, Sinclair Gardens, sorry, Investment 
Kensington Limited and Avon Estates, in each of those cases, um, the, the expression in connection with is to be found. And in, in neither case were those, that it, was that expression singled out as of having any broadening effect. The, the identification in the clause of the class of employee, professional advisors and agents, doesn't um, add to the argument doesn't capture these legal things because what those are, I would submit clearly um, directed towards, is the um, is advice on management or agency to carry out management. The employment of the professionals is still concerned with management. Um, and Sinclair Gardens is an example of a case where. Um, Sinclair Gardens is an example of a case where the clause was interpreted as being concerned with management. It was in connection with um, um, the provision of running of the estate. The judge, judge on Judge Bridge, interpreted that as being running the estate, meaning management. And he found that wasn't broad enough to capture the cost of tribunal proceedings. They all, they all turn on their own words, but they come back to the central point per Lord Justice Taylor in Seller House and Mears is that we're looking for clear and unambiguous language. Final point on this, if it, if it, if it is in, of assistance, um, is that uh, Judge Cook reached a decision by applying or following Iperian Investments Corporations and Broadwall Counts. She, she fell into error, I would submit, because what she effectively said, you see it's a paragraph 95, is that the word, paragraph 95 of the decision, is that she said, well, the wording in our lease is closely, it's, it's close, it comes closest to the, the wording in the lease in Hyperion, and for those circumstances I will follow Hyperion. I was saying she's wrong to do so because the exercise should be focusing on the words in this lease. Um, if I can just, perhaps, um, the f first point in respect of Iperion is that it's sub been subsequently said, um, perhaps respectfully, but by his Honour Judge Bridge in the Canon and 38 Lands Conjurer Street case, tab 38 of paragraph 64, that the Iperion is a decision with the benefit of judicial hindsight that now fits somewhat uneasily with the weight of authority. Point two on a period is it doesn't establish a principle. The principle is to be found in cellar house and mirrors. Point, point three is that Imperium um, was, in, in, on its wording, materially different because there was no qualifi qualification to class of person. It was all costs. It was that broad indemnity, um, broad wording one might find in a broad indemnity clause. Whereas ours is limited, ours is limited to the class of person who may be employed, professional advisors and agents. Um, fourthly, I think, it's important to look closely at the nature of the dispute for which the legal costs are incurred. So in, in asset holding Watts, um, the costs were incur incurred in connection with the party war dispute. And it was found that the costs were not recoverable um, under a clause that, um, that covered the management of the development. Rather, they were recoverable under a clause providing for all things, all, all acts, matters, and things desirable for the proper maintenance, safety, and amenity of the development. One can see there a dispute about a party wall would fall within acts or things desirable for the proper safety and amenity of the building. In that case, in Asset Wars, they said that they rejected the second argument, which was that those costs are captured by the proper fees and disbursements of any individual firm employed in the management of the development. So that's why it's important to look at the nature of the costs and pair them with the clause. 
So why is that relevant? Because when one goes back to Iperion, Iperion was actually concerned with enforcement action against a tenant who had carried out unlawful alterations. More significantly, perhaps, unlawful structural alterations. one could start seeing that more closely aligned with management, is to deal with the building. And our proceedings were not enforcement action. Proceedings were concerned with here are not enforcement action. They're to get a determination as to the amount that is payable. And that's where perhaps support for that submission can be found in contract real. We're calling contract real the underlying proceeding, the proceedings that, for which costs were incurred that led to the dispute, were in seeking a declaration as to the service charge. And it was said that those proceedings weren't proceedings for the recovery of rent. They're not enforcement of the obligation to pay rent. And that's because there's no order that can be enforced off the back. There's no order of, for payment. There's no obligation that rises from So, for those reasons, um, Judge Cook was wrong to place the weight that she did on our period. The point is to start with the point the, 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 the matter of principle. We bring up, we end up effectively where we started with what Lord Newberger says, which is, do, the, do these costs clearly belong within the scope of that clause? And I say, we say no. Um, subject to one very small point, those are my submissions on each of the grounds. And the very small point will take how long? Um, three minutes. I think let's have the three minutes. Um, it, it's, it's to do with costs. Yes. Paragraph 15 of our skeleton argument identifies that there was a separate decision by the Upper Tribunal on Section 20C. Owing to an administrative error at the Upper Tribunal, which was that the file was closed, permission to appeal was only granted last week. Yes. Whether that appeal is to be pursued is clearly dependent on the decision, the decision on the substantive dispute. What, what we're concerned with is, of course, time starts running for lodging a notice of appeal. What, what I would invite the court to do, and I, as I understand um, respondents do not object to this, is invite the court to extend the time for filing a notice of appeal to a date to be fixed when the court makes its order in this substantive appeal. That avoids us either expending, incurring additional costs or putting the court to utilising additional resource of this court to deal with an appeal that may not need to go anywhere. And, and the, the, the final point on that is because it, 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 in Section 20C cases, it is, has been said to be appropriate and it is ne necessarily desirable that the panel who is hearing the substantive dispute also hears the argument on cost. So specifically, what do you ask us to do? So specifically, I ask that you extend time for the filing of the notice of appeal to a date to be fixed when, we make your when you make your order. On this appeal. Correct. Um, we will then have seen your draft judgment and we can make a decision as to or have discussions as to how to case manage the proposed case manage that appeal. So you say at the moment we simply use the formula for date to be fixed. We don't say so many days after. Well, well, that, would be an alter that, that would be an alternative. The reason why I don't want I, I would invite you not to fix the period is because how long is needed may depend on well, may depend on what your decision is, how we interpret yes. it, and what's what discussions we have between us as to what's the time? What's the normal time limit? 28 days. So, just in case our judgment in this case was going to be taken on 28 days, you really need us, subject to what may be said on the other side, to make that order today anyway. Yes. Extending time. The, the, the extension of time, yes, correct. And if we made an order extending time to 28 days after judgment? No, sure. I mean, Realistically, that, that will be yeah. sufficient. Mr. Warwick can raise an objection if he uh, wishes to. Yep. Then there's no insist on you any further. Those are our submissions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll start again at 2 o'clock.